which I've been mulling over for the past three years. Um, mostly, I'm preaching to myself. This is a lesson that I need to listen to repeatedly. But hopefully, in hearing it, some of it will be encouragement to the rest of you. So I'll skip that first bit. Right. So first of all, this was going to be a lot longer, but I worked out how long it was going to take, so I had to cut a lot out. Who or from where do you learn things? Okay, have you got some suggestions? Children. Children. What else? Your wife. Other people? Parents? Teachers, lots of teachers, scout leaders, youth workers, the Bible, YouTube. TED Talks, YouTube, soap operas, everything. You can learn good and bad things. If you want to learn good things, I find it's best to find somebody who's got intention to teach you good things. I imagine, I consider that all of you here, there are people I don't recognize, as a body, want to instruct me in good things. In Galatians 6.6, 6, it says, The one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. I'm here in the hope that the good things I've learned over the past three years will be good for some of you. If some of it's repeated, some of it sound, might be very basic stuff, but I'm a scout leader. Rian's a teacher. There are other teachers and youth workers in the congregation. I'm sure, John, do you take encouragement when young people bring back to you fairly basic stuff that they finally understand. So that was that. That's why I think it's worth repeating that. And I'd like to see more of it. If we learn basic stuff and share that with each other, it is an encouragement. Yeah. Right, to the meat of it. Can you put a show of hands up? What do you feel is the most important to God? Is it your actions, your, your, actions, your motives, and your accomplishments? That's three different things. So who thinks what they accomplish is what's most important to God. Who thinks their motives is what's most important to God? Maybe a few. Who thinks what they do is most important to God? So mostly, there's a few for what they do, but most of you think it's your motives. Right. For 20 years, I was serving in a particular area of the church. Um, but for various reasons, I got to the point several years ago, where I was coming to meetings only because of the rota and only to set an example to my boys. That wasn't a good state to be in. I can admit that now. I didn't want to admit the other pe to the other people at the time that that was the case. Eventually, I managed to leave the sound team because that's what I was doing. And when I joined Withenshaw, I came to this congregation not being on any rota, which meant that when I came here, I could do it deliberately, knowing that I was choosing to come. After a year, uh, somebody left to go to university, and I was asked, if I would, to serve on the, the sound team here. I recognized that that would do away with my excuse, my reason. I'd, first of all, I'd have a re an excuse to have to come to the meeting because I had to serve, but I didn't like coming to meetings. But if I didn't do it, other people that I loved would have to do it more. It was an area in which I had some technical competence, and it's a job that needed doing. So I said yes. But I was really quite angry about it. Maybe some of you can relate to that, being asked to do something and feeling angry. I asked a friend of mine, I sent him a message saying that 2 Corinthians 9 7 says, Each of you should give, you got the slide, please, Mike, what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I've realized I may have rejigged my notes. They may not match the slides as they come. I've held on to that verse as an excuse for not doing anything. Because if I'm not doing it cheerfully, I would say I shouldn't be doing it. But I don't think that's a fair representation of what you should be doing. So I sent this message to my friend saying, God loves it. cheerful givers. What about the grumpy ones? What about the grudging ones like me? And he replied with Matthew, verses from Matthew 21. You got it? I'll read the whole thing. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. 
But later, he changed his mind, and he went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two sons did what the father wanted? As the first they answered. So, leaving aside that Jesus said this to the chief priests and the elders to compare them to the tax collectors and prostitutes, I think from this, that what you do in obedience counts more than what you will say you will do. However, it doesn't stop you being cross or begrudging, and I'll come to that later. Elsewhere in the Bible, in 1 Samuel 15, we read about when King Saul is told to go and do a particular thing and to destroy everything in this village, but instead he keeps back the flocks and some of it in order to make a sacrifice. And then through the prophet Samuel, God rebukes Saul and says, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. Now, I know there are times where I've said I'll do something and didn't do it. And I know there are times where God wants me to do this thing, and I said, I don't want to do that. Instead, I'll make a sacrifice. Sometimes that'll be money, or it could be serving in a different place. So there's this conflict between what God's asked me to do and what I'm choosing to do. And that's something I think most of us would have at different times. All right. So I'm going to talk now a little bit about somebody else who had a bit of an attitude problem. We got this. So anyway, it is from Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord. So he sets off from Tarshish, which is in the opposite direction, uh, for Tarshish. Right. I did look it up. Tarshish might well be Cadiz in Spain. It's right at the other end of the Mediterranean. It is a long way. It's not just that he ran down and got on the next ship. He went down, he bought a ticket. That's a deliberate action of running away, not the immediate reaction. So he has done something. He's decided in his head and his heart, God says this, I'm going that way. And he keeps going. You know the story. There's a big storm. The crew are scared. They work out that somehow Jonah is the cause, and they ask him who he is. Jonah says, I'm a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. This is Jonah who's running away. He knows who he is. He knows who God is. He knows he's not doing what God is, requires of him, and he recognizes the consequences, and still he professes to worship the Lord. The world around us would say, God says this, but you're doing that. Are you sure you're a Christian? The devil will say that here. People around us at work, on the bus, in newspapers would say that to us as well. Don't think that just because what you're doing now is in the opposite direction of what God wants, that you are not servants of God. The enemy will try and get into us through that. Be aware of that and don't take it on board. Back to the story. Jonah has been thrown overboard and swallowed by a big fish. He prays and promises to do what he's about to do. The Lord commanded the fish and it vomited him onto dry land. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. What does Jonah do? He goes and does it. He obeyed the word of the Lord, went to Nineveh, brings God's message, the Ninevites repent, and God sees it and does not bring down on them the destruction he had threatened. Hooray! <laughs> the book of Jonah could stop there, with a happy ending with repentance and no destruction. But it doesn't. We're only three quarters of the way through the book. Reading from chapter 4. To Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? 
The Bible doesn't say if Jonah replies, but it says he leaves and he goes off to watch the city. Maybe he's hoping for some destruction after all, like some people choose to watch news reports and rejoice at the destruction of their country's enemies. Jonah knows the character of God, but continues to be angry. It seems from the rest of the chapter, he persists in being angry with God or angry at the situation. It doesn't say whether he's choosing that or if he just can't shake it off, but he continues in that, despite God having a word with him, despite God bringing a plant to grow up and provide him shade, and then the next day a worm to eat the plant to take away the shade, so he's angry again. But Jonah still says he wishes he was dead and expresses that it would be better if he was. But despite Jonah's initial reluctance and his later anger, Jonah's obedience meant that more than 120,000 people who couldn't tell right from wrong came to repentance and were not destroyed. From the example of Jonah, the parable of the two sons, and what limited amount I know of the rest of the Bible, the best thing is to do what God wants and to do it willingly. The next, next best thing is to do what God wants, but with a less than good attitude. And the worst thing is to be disobedient completely. When I discussed this with Andy Bell from our huddle uh, some months ago, he said that being obedient but with a poor attitude is a poor second. Uh, if that's you, and I know it's me, God does want to give you and me a hope and a future and to change our attitudes. As an aside, if you are so angry that you think it would be better if you were dead, say so. Sorry, if Steph wants to interject here at all, I'd listen to Steph. Don't exaggerate, though. Be honest to yourself. Be honest to God. Tell somebody. Shout it to God. There's people here I know have shouted at God with horrible words because they were so angry about some situation. God can cope. If you are angry enough that you think you'd be better dead, say so. Uh, I checked it on the NHS. They said, do tell someone. If you can put things into words, it will help you understand your reasons. And if you can't really put it into words, if you don't want to talk to somebody about it, it suggests doing art or poetry. But definitely, I think if you can articulate your reasons, it will help you. And definitely tell God. Right. Having looked at obedience and attitude a bit, I'm going to look at three excuses I've used and some counter-arguments. And I want some suggestions. We're running a bit faster than I thought, so I want some suggestions back. So, first excuse is I can't do it well enough to be worth doing. Has anyone here ever thought that as something they've been asked to do? Go on. With friends here, you can put your hands up. A few. I'm too late. I missed the opportunity. And I'll be doing it for the wrong reasons. A couple. Please note that all these boil down to what I think of me and what I think of that situation. So, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm not comfortable being required to do something that I don't think I'm good at. That's compounded by having to be watched. doing it and I may have left me I have probably left meetings before early to avoid this sort of situation being here right now is not something that I've done lightly the bible is full of people discounting themselves from action because of their abilities can you think of any examples put your hands up John Moses. yep that's what I've came first anybody else Mary There are others, I'm sure. Go on, Catherine. Yeah. So there are some. There are some who say they can't do it. Can you think of other examples where somebody has brought something small that they think is not good enough and God uses it? Loaves and fishes. One with the two coins. The what? 
with a jar. Yep. So there are examples there. So the ones I wrote down were somebody bringing their packed lunch, five loaves and two fish. It's not very much. It's what they had. It feeds 5,000. And the widow with the two mites. And going back to that, sometimes the only thing you can offer isn't really that big a thing at all. I realized this morning that Job, when he was in his distress, his friends gathered, came to meet him, and they sat down on the ground for seven days and seven nights and didn't talk. That's a big sacrifice of comfort, but doesn't really require a great deal of skill. But that would bring comfort to somebody else. I'm a scout leader. Sometimes the biggest help parents give to me is to turn up and cut up 200 pieces of string. But that provides somebody else the means to do something more technical. Sometimes the little thing we can bring enables somebody else to do something bigger. But what we do, what we do is absolutely important. But whether it's poor quality or brilliant, it's what the Holy Spirit does with our actions that's important. And if we just think what happens is my responsibility, it takes away the fact and the recognition that the Holy Spirit will do something else with it. There's a thing which uh, previous American president Harry Truman said, imperfect action is better than perfect inaction. If I do something, however rubbish it is, it's still doing something. If I can sit perfectly still and do nothing, nothing is accomplished. So perfect or imperfect action is better than perfect inaction. Right, what was my other excuse for doing nothing? Who can remember? Too late. Oh. too late. Can you think of any examples of people saying they're too late? Or joining in late? So there were two sons in the parable. One, first of all, said, I won't do it, but then he did. Jonah said no and ran away. But later, God had given another chance, and he came back and did it. The prodigal son certainly came back. In the parable of the workers in the field, there were some people, and in some sermons I've heard them called various things, but we'll, we'll call them slackers, who turned up at the end of the day, joining in just before dusk, and they were rewarded. The Israelites chose not to cross the Jordan at the right time. And what did they have to do? <coughs> say again, Ant. 40 years in the wilderness until the people who'd led them to say, no, we can't do it, the people there are too strong, had died. 40 years waiting for another opportunity. The best boss I've had so far told me once, you don't fail till you stop trying. And it's worth remembering that. You could be lying down the ground wishing you were dead, you don't need to stop trying. Sometimes, though, you don't get another chance. In the parable of the young women with lamps, they weren't ready on time and so missed the party. You do need to be ready at all times to act when the opportunity comes, because sometimes you won't get another chance. Revolution Youth started some time ago. If you ask John, is it too late to join in, John? You may feel like you've started a race and lost track and fallen over. That doesn't mean you can't get up and start again. But you do have to think how you do that. So with gentleness, if you feel you've stopped, are you going to give up? Ask yourself, or are you going to figure out a way of carrying on? But remember, you don't stop. You don't fail till you stop trying. What was my other motive? Excuse I'll be doing it for the wrong reasons. Whoever thinks that they shouldn't do a thing because they know they'll be doing it for the wrong reason. That's probably one you don't want to put your hands up for. <laughs> so, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, ready before. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, because God loves yeah. cheerful giver. 1 Colossians 3, 23, whatever you do, do it enthusiastically as something done for the Lord and not for men. It's not a helpful thing to take one verse as a context for your outpoint or your standpoint. Everything should be taken in the context of the Bible. 
I'm very good, me, I'm not talking about any of the rest of you, at being reluctant and of feeling under compulsion and not being cheerful and not being enthusiastic. And I've used those verses as an excuse to not get involved or to limit what I'm doing. Thinking back to the previous example of Jonah and the two sons, and the people who turned up work for the end of the working day, whatever their motivations, excuses were, they eventually did what was wanted of them. I asked Mary, uh, she knows a lot more than me, for an example of someone who was commended by God for not doing what God wanted them, and she couldn't think of any. Not even if they had excuses of being grumpy, doing it badly, or starting late. But she could think of examples of people being rebuked for doing it with a bad attitude, but they had still done it. 1 Corinthians 13 says, if I, possess, if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Honestly, I don't think that we should aspire to do things just for our own gain, whether it's material or spiritual. And I think that love is what you do, not how you feel in here. So I would think on that basis, you can still choose to do good. And maybe if you recognize your feelings, treat them with less weight when deciding what to do. Then go to Philippians 1, 15, 18. I think I've got that up there. I'll read the whole thing. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice. I think somewhere between having perfect motives and false motives is where you'll find me and probably the rest of you. We might all aspire to be up there with perfect motives. That's not always going to happen. There's a saying, imagine the good we can do if we didn't care who got the credit. Uh, I was somewhere recently, I thought, imagine the good we can do if we didn't care if we're risking getting the blame if it goes wrong. There's a lot of good we can do if we can just separate the credit and our motives or the risk of getting blame. Don't let your motives be the deciding factor on whether you choose to do good or not. Right. I'd say, right, there's an example I had from, I'm a Cub Scout leader. I deal with eight to 10-year-olds. They come in, we have an hour and a half, two hours. We go camping occasionally. Early this year, I was doing another group, and we had a new Cub who'd come in. We were playing a game, and he came up to me and said, this is his words, on a scale of one to 10, how rubbish am I? How would you answer a question like that? So I knelt down, they're all this big. I knelt down and looked him in the face and said, look around. These are all better at throwing the ball than you and of catching it. They are stronger than you. But what are you doing? You're carrying on. You're carrying on and you will get better at this. Don't give up. So tell me again, what are you going to do? And he replied, I'm going to carry on. That's the thing to do. Romans 5 verse 4 tells us that perseverance produces character and character produces hope. If you've not got hope, persevere. Carry on going. Don't give up and you don't fail till you stop trying. If you feel like you started a race but have tripped up or hit the wall or bonked and are now sat on the side watching everyone else run past, don't give up. As I said before, one thing that my best boss so far has told me is you don't fail till you stop trying. But if that's you, and you're still on the side watching everyone else run past, pick something small and make a start. You don't rejoin a race at a sprint. You stand up, you stretch, you do a brisk walk. You have to warm up, and then you find a pace that suits your body, not everyone else's, and it suits the ground that you're on, not the road that everyone else thinks they're on. So persevere. Be aware that there is good for you to do, and you can do it. 
Ephesians 2.10 says, We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. If God has prepared some work for you to do, is it the capacity work that John would do? No. Is it the sort of work that I would do? Probably not. God's prepared work in advance for you to do is the work that you can do. Um, so, to summary, summarize, the best thing to do is to do what God's told you, and that might be a general biblical instruction. It might be the prompting of the Holy Spirit. It might be good that you've come across as you're going around that you recognize is there for you to do. It might be an invitation from somebody else to do a task within the church. And you can do it, and you might have a poor attitude, but that's something you can pray about. Going back to the early question, I think God is interested in what you do, what your motives are, and what you accomplish, but you are only responsible for what you do. The thing that's accomplished is more to do with how God's going to use what you bring. So don't worry about whether it's going to work too much. And think about what the Bible says. I think there's a view that each of us should do and to give what we can. But if you think about the wicked servant, he wasn't berated for not getting a good result. What was he berated for? Anybody? He was berated for not even trying. Right. So far, I recognize that all we've talked about is work, but my value, yours, doesn't come from work, what we do, and our identity shouldn't either. Jesus says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends for everything that I've learned from my father, I've made known to you. We are n there is work for us to do, but we're not shackled to it. We're not saved by it. Our value doesn't come from it. But God invites us into doing that and being part of his plan. The Bible tells us to fix our eyes on Jesus. I think if we do that, then we'll be not fixing our eyes on the problems or our limitations or things that could go wrong. We'll be fixing our eyes on him and concentrating on what the good is that we can do. And there's something else I've found, which is nothing we can do to make God love us more. There's nothing we can do to make God love us less. And I think we need to remember that.